Hi, good evening. How are we doing today? Good evening. I'm good. Good evening. That's good. Okay, so last week, um, I like, hope everybody's having a productive day and and we are relieved and prepared to retain some of this good information that the class is going to share with each of us. But just before we um get into, I guess I should give everybody um a few minutes so just to, so we can start on time. Um, Kendrick, can you give me a topic for the day, please? Sorry for that. My mute was life is mute. Uh, what was given to me was uh, downsizing, and I think that applied to how the supervisor handle layoffs. Downsizing okay. options. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, was it only downsizing, Kendra? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Um, Roseanne, thank you. Tanishka? My topic is... Oh, sorry. My mic is, my mic is muted. Tanisha, go continue, please. Okay. Recruitment, just yes, recruitment. Recruitment, okay. Okay, go ahead, Roseanne. Thank you. Performance appraisal. Okay, Yuri. Compensation and benefits. Okay. So, okay, so those four topics so far. Um, chapter five, if, if you were to look through it, talks about staffing and recruitment. We will see a repeat of some of the topics we've already dealt with, um, performance appraisals. Um, I think we touched slightly on comp um, compensation when we talked about equity. And, you know, you want to ensure that um, persons are just as qualified as you um, to carry out jobs. Um, and then it talks about the human resource um, management process. Okay. So everybody had a topic. So I'm certain by now all of us have an overview of what the chapter talks about. And we can just go through, um, I guess, the discussions or the topics that you did some research on. Um, before we start, I do want to share, um, all of you have the agenda. I just want to see where we're at um, right now and to make sure that everybody is on the same track as I am. Um, we are in week nine. Um, we have three chapters left after chapter five. Um, again, remember, I'm trying to scale down, not give you too much message overload, but um, you know, just discuss the important parts with you. And so for this class and next class, hopefully we can end by 7, 7.30 and you will have the opportunity to, you know, work on your mentoring um, presentation or we have a quiz next week and we need everybody to be on par for your quiz. Now, remember, 20% um, of your grade is the quizzes as well as your midterm. Um, and we've done one quiz already where I sent that home for homework and I got that back. This second quiz is going to be time. And so what I'm going to do is next week, um, Tuesday, there's going to be in your email a quiz at 6 p.m. You have until 6.30. It's going to be 25 multiple choice questions. It's going to be chapter um five and chapter 10. You have 25 multiple choice questions and you have to return it by 6 30. If it's not returned by 6 30, you don't get a grade. Now I know we had some hiccups with the last um quiz where you know the quiz was about two pages. Some people returned one, some people didn't return it, some people you know had some issues with it. 
unfortunately for this quiz, if you have an issue, I mean, you know, sometimes the electricity goes off or what have you, whether if there's an issue, we won't be able to give you a grade for it, okay? And again, a lot of persons come to class late. Um, please arrange yourself to be on time um, next week so that there are no issues with, you know, you not having sufficient time to complete the quiz. So it will be in your inbox at 6 p.m. You have to return it by 6.30 in order to get the grade. Um, if you don't return it by 6.30, just count it as practice um, to, you know, for the final exam. Okay, and then um, you can sign on um, into the Zoom and then we'll talk about um, some parts, I guess the control process is about the only part in chapter six that we really need to cover. And then you can use the remainder of the time for your mentoring um, um, presentation. And so I just want a little update about the mentoring presentation before we start with chapter five. I wanna see um, where persons, because uh, one or two persons reached out to me for some help this week. So I just wanna know, you know, where we are with the um, project. Is everything that I said so far clear? Ms. Bullard, just a question. The quiz which you sent us from um, last class, were you supposed to send that back in or that was just for practice? That was just for practice. Okay. And then you're gonna have one again tonight. It's just going to be for practice. Okay. And this is why I want, you know, you still have your agenda. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the time the information is right there. So please take some time to read it so you know where we are. Okay. See, so it says week 10. You can see my screen. Chapter six. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where next week Tuesday at 6 p.m. We'll be having a quiz. Yeah. You have 30 minutes to send it back. It's okay. okay. If you want a grade, that'll go towards 20% for your quizzes and your homework. Okay. okay. Ms. Buller, just a question. Um, oh, I don't know, I'm sorry, it's the last. It'll come back to me, sorry. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so everybody is clear about next week. So yes. please arrange to be on time or to not be driving and not leaving work or what have you, please make some arrangements this week. So right, perhaps take your lunch hour at five or four so you can leave early and get home in sufficient time so you can get that grade. Okay. Uh, which, which part is we gonna concentrate on in chapter six, man? The chapter is not on, the, the exam is not on chapter okay. six. No, 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 I mean, you said after the exam, this one portion that we're really gonna concentrate on. Yeah, it's just the control process. Yeah, there are steps of control process. Yeah, and so then at the, by the end of this, um, we'll assign depending on how this class goes with the assignment to see if that's more beneficial. We'll assign parts of chapter six to everybody, but we, I'm gonna see how this one goes first. Then to okay. decide if it if it makes sense or if it helps or not. Okay. Yeah, but I'm just switching it up to see if you know this will be easier for everybody okay but after um today we have three chapters left and and then um that will be basically be it um you'll have your mentoring presentation on the 30th then um some persons may trickle over and tell the six depending on how long the presentations are and then we will have review for the final exam and, and then that'll be it and the final exam is on April 13th. It'll be just like your um, midterm exam where you go into BIFs and, and you sit, Ms. Bullard, sorry, Ms. Dean will expect you and you sit the um, final exam at BIFs. Okay, Ms. Bullard, that's, that's locked in stone because I don't know if I could take that day off. Yeah, well, yes, it is locked in stone. Um, you know, the, from the beginning of the class, I said, this is why we have an agenda. So you could go into your offices. Normally each um, institution, they give you two study days off. And so I would have wanted you to put that in from weeks ago, you know, <laughs> apply for your, your two study days or whatever is allotted to you. 
because you don't want to be overwhelmed. You don't want to feel rushed. You want to come in enough time that the traffic or picking up from school or whatever. You know, can somebody mute their mic, mics, please? I'm getting some background. Yeah, so yeah, so try to, you know, not be overwhelmed or rushed or, you know, and have a little bit of anxiety for the first 30 minutes of the test. And then, you know, a lot of people call me back and say, oh, Miss Bullard, this is what happened. I didn't take the day off. I was rushed or I felt overwhelmed and I didn't do my best. Okay, so just organize yourself and, and, and plan ahead and it'll be much more achievable and easier. Understood. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so um, last week, we also, you know, nobody has their 5% yet. Um, I don't know if y'all don't think y'all need it, but um, I know one person said that they wanted to discuss um they attended something and they want to discuss it this class is is that does it still stand i don't remember who no nobody okay that's fine um i'm kind of hoping for an email but <laughs> well the um, the the ones that um i have uh, like all aml related because i also teach compliance and aml so you can go on Facebook. I'm all of us are on Facebook, right? And just Google um, Kawana's Toastmasters or Rotary, and you'll see it, it will pop up. You know, and you you'll see um, their events. They normally have a schedule or a calendar, or they'll have the information there where you can sign in via Zoom. I'm gonna do that tonight. Yeah, yeah. Try, try. Do research, get yourself out there, put your name out there so people are familiar with you and you build your network. Okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Any questions? No, we all, we are aware of the uh, quiz next week. We know what's required. We know that we won't get a grade if it's not in by 6.30. And we know that it's on chapter 10 and five and 25 questions. You have half an hour to turn it in. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Fabian, um, what's your topic for tonight? And she shared some Kendrick, I think we're getting some feedback from you. Okay, Fabian. Denise? Are, are we here? Um, is Margaret? Anybody? Somebody answer me, please. Sorry, I, I, I was I, you ready for my. Sorry, I I was okay. thinking. I thought she, I didn't realize I was still muted. I'm okay, thing. so you go. Well, I can't see you talking because of the screen. But okay, Denise, I guess I'll go after you. No, I'm asking you what your topic is. Oh, I, I thought you were ready for me to go. My topic is the interview process. And who was that? Who was that, Margaret? Margaret, yes, ma'am. Okay, interview process. Okay, Denise, my topic was HR. Okay, okay, so we'll start with with Denise and Fabian. <coughs> Good night. Um, sorry, what were you asking? What is your topic for tonight? Um, sexual harassment. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, the chapter talks about staffing and recruiting. And so um, it starts with the human resource management process. So we want to start with Denise, and then we want to go from Denise then to Tanishka and talk about recruitment. And then we'll go to Kendrick, Roseanne. Yuri, and then Margaret. Are we ready? Are we? Tell me, are we ready? 
I'm ready. I don't know if everyone. You're ready? Okay, good. Go ahead. Okay, good night, everyone. So, um, chapter five, my topic was HR. So I'm gonna start reading. The quality of the department and entire organization is to a large degree determined by the quality of people it employs. Success for most supervisors depends on finding the right employees with the ne necessary skills to successfully perform the tasks required to attain the company's strategic goals. Staffing and human resources management decisions and methods are critical to ensuring that the organization hires and keeps the right personnel. You may be thinking, sure, personnel decisions are important, but aren't most of them made by people who specifically handle human resource issues? That's true. It's, sorry, it's true that in many organizations, a number of acti activities grouped under the label human resource management are done by specialists in human resources. In other cases, HRM activities may even be outsourced to companies, but not all supervisors may have HRM staff support. Small business owners, for instance, are an obvious example of individuals who frequently must do their own hiring without the assistance of HR specialists. Even supervisors in large organizations are frequently involved in recruiting candidates, reviewing application forms, reviewing applicants, inducting new employees, making decisions about employee training, providing career advice to employees and evaluating employees' performance. So whether or not an organization provide HRM you, HRM support activities, every supervisor is involved with human resource decision in his or her unit. Exhibition 5.1 introduces the key components of an, of an organization resource management process. It represents eight activities or steps, the purple shaded boxes that, if properly executed, will staff an organization with competent high-performing employees who are capable of sustaining their performance level over the long term. The first three steps represent employment planning, the, uh, the, the adding of staff through the recruitment, the reduction of staff through downsizing and selection. When executed properly, these steps lead to the identification and selection of competent employees. These activities are important to assist organization in achieving their goals. Accordingly, once an organization, organization's plans have been established and organization structure have been designed, it is now time to add the people. The one, it's one of the most critical role of supervis for supervisors. Once you have selected competent people, you need to help them adapt to the organizations to the organization and to ensure that their job skills and knowledge are kept current. You do it through our orientation, training and development. Somebody, oh. pardon me. Oh. The last step is the HRM process are, deter are designed to identify performance goal, correct performance problem if necessary and employees sustain a high level of performance over the entire work life. The activities in the involved inclusion include performance appraisal, compensation and benefit, and safety and health. Notice in exhibition 5.1 that the entire employee pro employment process is influenced by the external environment. Many of the factors introduced in chapter two, such as globalization, downsizing and diversity directly affect all management practices, but their effect is probably not is probably most severe in the management of human resource because whatever happens to an organization ultimately influence what happened to its employees. So every supervisor must have a fundamental understanding of the of the current laws and regulation governing equal employment opportunity. So, yeah, um, do I need to explain 5-1? Well, 
well, you know, I I didn't I don't know if that would did everybody is just going to read the chapter or what the book says on the I, uh, did some of us do like research to add to this or anything? I know everybody just wants to read the what the book says. So well, my reasoning was the last time when we had a uh, similar um, similar ish topic, or I mean, I kind of break it down, and everybody else just read from the book. So I figured, okay, so maybe I just need to read from the book. So I don't know, maybe I was. I don't know. That's what I was thinking. Okay, Kendrick, you thought the same thing? I guess Basi I don't know. I th oh, sorry, sorry, ma'am. I basically was thinking the same way as Denise, but even in that regard, there are a few things that I've read, I got some questions about, some queries about, in regards to my section, because a couple of organizations that I have been working for, I see some of these same things happening. Okay. Tanishka, what about you? I did. I um I read the book and I did uh research online, just Google. So I could be discussing. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to I, I didn't know, you know, if what I was saying would I was clear. So yeah, I did expect you to read the passage that related to your topic and then go on Google and do some research and, and add to it. But that, that's fine, Denise. Um, what I did is I looked at something to think about. Did, did you have an opportunity to look at that on page 113? No, ma'am, I didn't. Actually, I started to, because I, 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 yes, let me say yes. I answered the questions, I did. Okay, okay, good. And so I thought those questions were um, very good for us to go over. Um, I also looked, I saw this thing on LinkedIn that came out that said, you know, um, HR is not just a handbook. HR is not organizing parties and barbecues. HR is not about handing out candy at Halloween or on independence. And HR is definitely not payroll. HR is about increasing awareness on the impact every decision has on people. HR is empowering leaders with the right coaching so they can make the best decisions. HR is about putting people first. HR is about helping each individual find a fulfilling career. HR is the gatekeeper of culture. HR fuels business results and HR is a business partner. So, you know, they want to change the image of HR where people just feel like if you have a problem um, or it's time for a party, we go to them and see what's appropriate or, and what have you. And so, they are trying to change, I guess, I don't know, the culture or the way um, the organization looks at them. Um, and they wanna ensure that everybody know that they are putting people first. Um, it also says that HR is about providing the best tools and programs to engage employees from hire all the way to retirement. So they wanna sit with you and, and put programs in place to ensure that you are planning, um, they want to ensure that you understand work-life balance and the various benefits that are available to you. And so I know the other day um, I was at an institution doing an audit and they had a health and wellness fair, you know, and the HR department channeled that and they said, um, you know, I thought it was very nice where, you know, they um, invited um, the insurance um, people to come or and a nurse to come and take your blood pressure and what have you. And from the results, um, you know, they found that some people were high, hypertensive and so they didn't just stop, stop and say, okay, well now you know your results. They went a bit further and then they um, organized a, some persons went to the gym, but then they organized a few weeks of aerobics as well to, you know, for the institution. So, you know, I thought that was very good and very hands-on for them to not just, you know, say, okay, we find out half of y'all hypertensive, but, you know, um, we just can leave it there. And then they went even further um, to the cafeteria, spoke to the cooks and said, you know, this is what we found out. Um, could you perhaps, you know, not use so much salt, what have you. And so there were many initiatives to try and help the 
you know, the staff along the way. So I thought that was really good. And so I looked at these questions, you know, and I think so, so much time, you know, many times there are real issues in organizations and we're not really trained properly to, um, you know, deal with the tougher issues. And a lot of times we, we sometimes we say, oh, Oh, that's what happened with Miss Bullard. We about to gossip about it and later on when we talk about harassment, I hope sexual harassment. I hope we can also just touch on what harassment is, how we intimidate um, each other, you know, because of beliefs and culture and um, education and all sorts of stuff. So we want to ensure that nobody is harassed. But I want to, um, you know, deal with some of the tougher issues. And so we, you know, prepare ourselves for when people actually have real life issues or real things happen, can we really deal with it? You know, we don't want to be shocked and, and just say, well, we never thought of this. And so now we have to go and do research. And so um, some of the questions that they ask is just consider whether you believe it's okay to do or whether it should create a problem for the organization. Um, and one thing that really, um, number two, a waiter at an exclusive restaurant is fired when his supervisor finds out that he tested positive for HIV. I, I think that's a bit tough. So, so how how do we deal with 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 an issue like that? And I know years ago, um, persons were finding out. You know, you had to go to get a health certificate where they did blood work and stuff like that. And now they've changed it to a class because there are many people living with HIV and we just don't know who it is. Um, you know, the, the factory that makes those pills for HIV is right in um, Freeport. And so right out of the Bahamas, we distribute the, pay, you know, those pills would allow people now to build up their immune systems. And a lot of persons are living with HIV. I mean, HIV, are, are we prepared to deal with those types of situations? And this is fast food. But what you need is in, in the fast food areas, you only need a, you go down, you sit to a class, it talks about cleanliness, washing your hand, ensuring that your head is covered and, and what have you. So there's no test to get the food handler's permit. So Denise, I mean, how would you deal with that as a supervisor if you found out that one of your staff members were HIV positive and you know, all the stigmas surrounding HIV, um, what would you do? Um, it, it was this employee working with me for years. Did he just, I'm yeah. saying like, did he just contract the HIV he, or did we hire him with will HIV? Will that matter? Will any of that matter? Um, it kind of matter. If you hire no. him with HIV at this point in time, what are you trying to do? But I'm thinking so if- is there a clause in your- No, your, I'm not saying that there is, but what I'm saying is- Do we even have to disclose that? I think he should. Yes, he should, eh? If you have no, oh, no, he doesn't have to disclose that. I if working if he was if he was a teller, or if he was working. We have equal opportunity for all, right? I mean, I'm saying I I would want to. I think I would want to know, especially why you can't he, you can't food. contract it from touching him. That you, would, no, why you, you can't. Would that you you can't. Like, but yet he's in the kitchen handling sharp tools and objects. No, that that you you discriminate. Hmm. Yeah, I'm but he could get cut anywhere. A desk could scrape him. Something exactly. And I mean, anywhere. Maybe I am discriminating, but I would yeah, want to. You know. are. You borderline. Yes, you are. I no, would he does not. A person does not have to disclose that they have HIV to their employer. Because nobody would hire them. So at the imagine end, of the people with HIV. At the end of the day, me being personally me being somebody with HIV would not want to work in a kitchen. Yeah, but suppose oh, you were the chef. okay, I understand yeah. what you mean. You mean if you were the person who actually have but HIV, you I would not want other to. Person. Exactly, yeah. I would not want to. Okay, Denise, I understand that. Denise, so let's I say would... you you've been the culinary school you was an executive chef. You don't just uh, get HIV mm -hmm. before you go to college. But the person might want to try it as normal as possible. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. So at that point in time, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm just saying, personally, me, I would not want to work in a kitchen. 
So you have your have degree. HR. You have your degree in culinary oh. arts, and you will find another job somewhere because you have HIV. Really? You think that's what people with HIV do? It? This whole no, it's, no, that's not. A, that's a, a matter of fact. Go ahead. It's full of, we, it's full we, go, go ahead. There's, there's so much people that actually live in, that mm. actually work in a field that is not related to where their degree or what, what they actually went to school for. There's plenty of people doing that. I'm, yeah, not, I'm, not, saying, I'm not trying to just. Yeah, we are creating a scenario. You went to college, yes. you have a degree in culinary arts. You are now going to say, I cannot cook anymore. What about you cooking at home and for your children? Suppose you are a mother and you have children at home. Are you not no longer going to cook for your children? I'm you not have... saying that at all. Huh? I'm well, she. I think what she's all. saying is if, you, oh, if she is the person who is exposed to HIV, she would not have a job where she could possibly expose and no, other person. I can I be think. a front desk clerk. I can work in some lumber store. But see, I that's discrimination because you can't in the jewelry store. Can and cannot work, which is against the law. Which one? I'm not discriminating. I didn't say that. <laughs> that's I'm, not even saying that. I'm not even saying that. You which cannot one? discriminate persons. I'm not. A job. You should, it should be somebody. No, he's asking. Kendrick, we ain't going that far. That's him. We have an employment law class that will tell you, okay? And, but, and but I am an employment law. They, they do have discrimination All this laws. All goes back to put Kendrick. So. Anyway, I just want y'all to be uh, okay. Uh, Ms. Know, Ms. Muller, just, just, just one point. Uh, in regards to somebody and their disclosure, how would you then handle the situation if you're HR? And this person is a part of your group insurance. They're part of your group insurance in the workplace. So the insurance, oh. uh, when it's group, um, they're not allowed. They do ask you, but they it's the whole um purpose of group. They're not allowed um to uh, what do you call it pre something conditions. They're not allowed to 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 not um um insure you it's, because of pre existing conditions. And when okay. it's group. Very okay, good. No. okay I, I'm just asking questions. Yeah, I mean, thought about. Yeah. But see, the thing about it is we, when we get to these positions, mm -hmm. we, we need to ensure that we are educated and, you know, we find solutions. And this is the whole point. We want to be the manager and we want to be the supervisor and we want that pay increase. But we do we really want, you know, to deal with the very tough issues? And the thing about it is sometimes people won't disclose it to you. Sometimes... It, it can happen to any of us. All of us could have been working to whatever financial institution for the last 20 years. And then today we contract HIV. What do we do? Put the person in the back office and make them feel like something wrong with them if they're healthy, just as healthy as anybody else. I mean, I think about it. I, I want you all to know that it's not a better rule assist when you get to these positions and you dress up and say, oh, I'm the supervisor, I give out rules and regulations or I make sure. No, there are people dealing with real issues. Okay. okay? And then you would need to know their exact law to ensure that you don't dis discriminate in any way. Okay, whether it's a new person or a person that has been working there for many years. And Denise, just, I understand what you say. You would not want to work in, in you know, cooking for anybody where you could possibly expose, but I'm sure you can't tell your children, mommy ain't gonna cook no more, we only eat fast food. No, but you know, that's, you have a support system. No, I'm saying that's one that's, that's one or two K, one or two, maybe three. I'll have to deal, I can manage and be extremely careful with one or two or three. But when you no, so anyway, never mind. But do you think it. people with HIV are trying to expose other persons? No, they just want to live a normal life. Miss they Bill, have a disease, there's no cure so for it. You would be surprised to know no, who are just I sharing that. that, just sharing yeah. and giving it away because the person who gave it to them didn't tell them they had it. Yeah, but we talk about I'm just saying, work. I'm just saying. Yeah, we're just talking about work. But you have to find a solution for the person, okay? So, and I don't think the solution sense. is saying um, you're fired because you have HIV or we, you just go stay home and we can pay you because we're afraid. No, but that ain't even that ain't okay. So let's say okay. So this is the next thing that came to mind. Let's say this same person we have no knowledge of uh, this person having this disease, and um, let's say this person end up having some kind of uh 
fall or accident to work or something. I don't know, whatever it is. Something happens on the job, whereas that they're going to need medical assistance. Medical assistance actually come in, not just get the CPR kit. Okay, so now you have other staff involved now trying to do their best to uh, not only assess the situation, but to help as best as they can. But nobody really knows what's going on or what. If, if somebody blood gets on you and they have HIV, you won't get I'm it. not saying that you can catch it from that. Did you say it? I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is, let's be realistic. Things happen. No, 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 there are lots, and this is why HR has to be extremely confidential. Because when people find out things, they already they come up with you know all the what ifs. They they send you to these CPR resuscitation class and all kind of you things. Be, so you, you may be walking down the street and you may fall out, or I you know, and somebody has to give you CPR. Do you want that person to give you CPR or do you want that person to say, wonder if this person has AIDS or any other community? I, I don't think I want that person to put their mode on me. You want them to save your life? Call 911. <laughs> you don't want me to put my mode on you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yuri, you okay. You can do that, Yuri. Man, look at you. You're all deep today. I'm the exception. I'm the exception. I don't know. Anyway, like I say, you'll have to be extremely, if y'all ever want to work in HR, you'll have to be extremely sensitive and again, find solutions because we don't live in perfect where a bunch of perfect people come to work and they just follow the rules and you know these real life things happen. I mean, look at the amount of people that have cancer. That's you true. think all of them really have cancer? No, sometimes we have to tell you all they have cancer just so y'all wouldn't um um you know discriminate against them. Okay, so these real life things that can happen. Okay, hold on, hold on, Miss Bullet. You can't move yet. You can't move yet. <laughs> I get a question now. Go ahead. What is what is the role of HR in organizations? Are they the balancing stick between staff and management, or are they management heavy? Well, I I I was always taught that HR was the under the CEO, the the next most powerful position in an oh. organization. Oh, okay then, because I've been trying to understand for a while. Right, and so this yeah. is why they write this. We are business partner, we are gatekeeper of culture, we are, you know, they trying to change their the look, image. Their image, right. So, so basically, I mean, because I can't agree with what Kendrick is saying. In essence, um, HR is not HR mandates managers and supervisors to fulfill these roles. HR no no, 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 no. HR coordinates that. Okay. So these job descriptions and come down from the board and so HR will um probably review it and you know compliance so ensure that they are compliant and they coordinate, you know, with managers to make sure they properly assess their their um persons. You know, so not necessarily that I, I, I don't know if HR will necessarily write the job description, the manager of that department or the head of that department should be responsible and HR coordinates it. Make sure that your um, um, appraisals are done. They are handed in on a certain time. Persons are in agreement and this would be the bonus. You know, so they are the coordinators of it not so much the writers of it or they just ensure that you say you need five people in your department make sure you have five job descriptions and titles and we are gonna make sure that these are priced and and given a um uh you know a job scale or, or along the job scale and in the past all of this used to be done by hr but as you know um these different um i guess persons became more trained um, they put managers or heads of the departments should have, they should be experts in their department. Uh, that manager should know what the credit department needs, not necessarily HR. And then that manager has to go to HR and advocate for a budget for the number of staff that they, that they need. 
Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, but they are still considered the most powerful, the second under the CEO, the second most powerful um department in an organization. Go ahead, Kendra. Okay, okay. Let me let me get all of this off my chest. We on each other. Um if there's a disagreement between me and a supervisor, well, you're supposed to go to HR, correct? HR is supposed to act as a mediator, yes. No. There's a chain of command. There, there's a chain, chain of command, but here's the question. How do I, as an individual, mm -hmm. feel as if I'm getting a fair shake when HR is considered management? Well, again, um, I uh, think Denise I just said there's a chain of I command. Know. So if it's a supervisor, there should be a manager or a head of um, that department. And then you go outside the department to HR. And even though um, HR is considered management, um, they, you, you know, they have credibility and they are, you know, their employee, you know, it's twofold there. Um, is an employee opinion, and some um, organizations, you know, share that um, with their staff where they get an employee opinion survey. And so that's, you know, as managers, if I didn't get a specific rating on my employee from my employees, then I, I got not met, you know. And luckily, I had ten employees, and and six did love me, and four hated my guts. So those six was was able to help pull up the four who hated my guts. That that's just how it worked. So the you know HR upholds the culture, upholds credibility. I mean, people will say it's a waste of time to go to HR. They are not confidential. They are not. <coughs> Sorry. Right? Yeah, I don't trust. I, I don't trust. I don't have the I don't have the confidence in HR. You know. Uh, people we record so okay. Okay. Yeah. So fine. Yeah. So uh, they are supposed to be credible. I can't okay. tell you in all organizations they are. Ms. Ms. Pollard, I got one more question. When you find out this stuff, then you, try, you start the job post. You either advocate for change, put some stuff through the, um, 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 the suggestion box, find somebody on executive level who feels the same way you feel, or, or, or start to look for another job. Yeah. Like I say, all work. I've all, it's it's good to work with these uh, Fortune 500 companies. Cause like I said, I worked with Royal Bank for 16 years. I had two supervisors that hated my guts and four that loved me. Okay, sometimes you in the valley, sometimes you on the mountain. When I saw that me and these people attitude was going to clash, I stayed. I said, "What am I here for? My purpose." I need to learn this because I expect to be management. So I have to stay here in the valley because I have a bigger purpose. So I have a higher calling, you know what I mean? So I'm in my valley days taking this bad treatment because this is going to get me to where I want to be. Or I look around and Royal Bank always had, at least this was back in the day now, at least 20, 30 different positions. And I said, well, let me jump ship. After two years, I felt like I was fully trained. I had mastered my position. I left. Anytime before the two years, I suffered until it was time to leave. But I, I did not, I, I, in my 16 years, I probably had five or six positions because when me and you didn't get along, I, I here for a purpose and then I leave. Once I had satisfied my two years, I was gone. So if you stay in it for 25 years, something wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because there is a choice. But when you see uh, the overall culture of an organization is, is is tarnished and they have a bad reputation and they don't follow policy and procedure, why, why would you stay? There are better companies out there. And like I said, with Royal Bank, I, I, there are five different entities. I worked in all five. Because a lot of the back office stuff that I did, internal control, the same branch that I ran from, I had to be the auditor for that branch. And I said, oh, God, I just can't deal with that manager. So let me go to trust. Let me go to private banking. Let me go to Dominion Security. So when you work for these larger companies, you have the flexibility to still retain your years 
and just move throughout the, com the, the company. But I didn't stay in one position for 16 years. So if you worked at a larger bank, then you don't have to stay there and take this mess. And you will find that um, it's very different. It's a very different culture. I started off with Finkel Robinson Road and Key West Street. Like I say, those people, you know, we was the ghetto branch, but they are the godparents to my children. We attend church together. We, I have still, I haven't worked there for four years and I still have very good um, friends that come to my house. My best friend is from there, okay? Um, then I went to um, head office, completely different, you know, everybody prim and proper and think that they, you know, is an executive and, um, you know, it was just too, cushy and too, I had to wear heels every day and a full face of makeup and that just wasn't me. And then I went to trust, no human factor at all. So, you know, it's the pros and cons and you just have to say what's your purpose at that point in your life. So it really just depends on you. Question, um, why? At that time, you had to, uh, like the culture was the heels and the, and the makeup on a daily basis. You ever were, you ever have with people talk about the hotel staff? Oh, that's why I never could have worked there. Filo staff? <laughs> read that again, read that term again, Filo? No, Atlantis. Okay, casino yeah. staff. Oh, casino, Atlantis and casino, yeah. Yeah, they look for a certain look. They, they, they don't hire you if you don't look yeah. And you can't go in Atlantis Casino, Dragon Slippers, and take you know yoga stand out. No, you have to have a certain look. And then head office, that's that they normally wear suit every day, you know. Whereas in some branches, you could get away with slacks and a collared shirt or whatever. No, and head office or some positions a suit every day. So it just, like some people, it, it it don't matter to to them. To me, I I was already comfortable. Right. And then I was in a with in uniform, and now I must wear my own clothes. You, you know what I mean? I have to find an outfit, like stuff like that. Is you know, and then you you got, you want to keep a certain image, or people don't take you seriously. Your first impression is always lasting, you know. When I didn't wear heels, they used to say, "But what happened to you today? You said, okay. <laughs> just they used to tip to you know. It it just depends." It just depends. The different culture. I mean, it just depends. Okay, so good, good discussion. But be prepared for the the, the tough things because that HIV one is very tough. Okay, and so you probably have to go and do some research to find a solution to ensure that the staff is safe, that person's um um health is protected, and and um you try your best not to you know the proper controls are in place if it is that they work in the kitchen, and they have HIV or any other disease, you know, that can spread. <laughs> spread. Yes, ma'am. Yes, right. ma'am. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, the next I one appreciate is, that just now. Though. Okay, you good. You educated good. me. <laughs> yeah, I open up. I open up the news. Prepared for the dust things. Okay. All right. Just jaw dropping things to this happen in these offices. You'll be surprised. Okay. And the next one is. You want to take 12 weeks off without pay to care for your new child during the busiest part of your work year. And your supervisor denies that request. What do you think about that? But you, what are you taking the 12 weeks off for? Sorry. Two. Okay, so automatically you get 13 weeks after you would have had a baby, right? Yes. And so is a you want to take an additional 12 weeks off. Christmas, you had, your baby, you had your baby and your 13 weeks ends in November and you know they say no vacations in December, right? Or no vacation after Thanksgiving. So here it is, you do back on that Thanksgiving week and you say, I need an additional 12 weeks. Where these 12 weeks coming from? What you mean, where they coming from? You just had a baby. <laughs> no, but your 12 weeks off, you only get the managers, most have what, six weeks? That's no, a, everybody has 13. That's, a, that's a leave of absence. That person wanted, okay, I'm assuming. 
okay, y'all are saying that, right? But think about this. In um, Hungary and in Japan, they get 86 weeks. Only 52 in a year, though. Okay, so they get a year <laughs> up and a half to raise, you know, there is to raise a new baby. Oh, yeah. And in fact, this is so bad that the U.S. is having a child care crisis because they don't have sufficient daycares and then the, where they have such a shortage, daycare is so, so expensive. So they, they are looking at the European models like Hungary and um, um, Iceland and the Netherlands to see if um, they can afford some way to assess organizations to allow at least the first year off. Okay, so that's a sabbatical, basically. The baby in one year, I mean, would you like to leave your newborn baby to a nursery? How much, of, how much of us have to do that, though? Canada, I think, is one year off as well. Okay, and then what about the fathers? I don't want to stay home for one year. You know, I want my husband to take some of this baby stress and making up three o'clock in the oh, morning. Oh, you be selfish. You be selfish. Big, just one big paternity insufficient for fathers? No, you could stay home with the baby. Everything go on. And I and, and I be be in no rush with no paternity either. And I be okay. So when you you know we are, we deal with a very diverse organization, right? And we have people from all around the world. Um, we have different nationalities, different cultures. Um, and Japan, like we have a lot of Chinese. I don't know how many Ch Japanese. Um, we have. So don't be surprised. When your um, person from Jap you know, Japan is pregnant and says, you know, I married a Bahamian, but then we decided to live here and I'm about to have a baby and I'd like the rest of the year off. Okay, don't say this woman crazy. She wants You're to have a baby. She don't mean, no, find a solution ah. <laughs> for all women to, to you know, and, and 13 weeks, I mean, it increased from six to 13. But uh, if other countries are having 18 months and more than a year, you know, and even in the Bahamas, there's a child care crisis because there are only two government nurseries. You all aware of that? All of these babies being born every day, only two government nurseries. And I'm sure they can only take 50 students each. So out of the, let's say, thousands of babies that are being born each year, only 100 have a space in daycare. So... Ms. Bullitt, at this point in time, this is where I love to say where culture really influences what's going on. Our culture is 13 weeks. But that doesn't mean that's the end all and be all and doesn't mean that it's right? No, 13 that weeks. doesn't mean it, it ends all. But like you say, the Japanese or the Asian, whichever female asked for the rest of the year or you would think she crazy or would you no would you hr will have to consult on that because the producer supervisor remember that's why yeah I but i still have to go to hr how can i give somebody uh the rest of the year off that no, is be up I... way above my program i still will have to consult the powers that be what 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 you can do as the manager because this is an hr's decision you can have a conversation two ways you could either call hr and say listen miss bullet crazy <laughs> she talking about she need the year off and you all gotta let her go after she done had this baby. Or you can have the conversation that Miss Bullard is of Japanese descent. In her country, she if she was in her country, she would have 86 weeks. However, and they, they are paid weeks. However, she knows that in the bomb she will only have 13 weeks, but she has decided to take the remainder of the weeks off without pay. Without we pay. wanna support her. And we will we are going to hire somebody part time support to support her while she's on the leave to care for her child, and then we will bring her back afterwards. So two so, very different conversations, right? I agree. That is, yeah. At the end of the day, it's still an HR decision. I mean, yeah, regardless, yeah, no, the manager's decision. I right. HR could have listen to me. HR, I was internal control. I was audit in Royal Bank, and you know the managers used to tell me. I am the manager of this bank, miss. You don't tell me what to do. This was my decision. I used my discretion. So, okay. Ms. Bullitt, so, Ms. Bullitt, Ms. and you're this. Go, go, go ahead, Janice. I just want to say something to Ms. Bullet. In your discretion, based on that same scenario, what would have happened at Royal Bank? 
the same thing. It depends on which conversation I had. I would go with my business case and say, this is the decision that I have made as the manager. Woo. If y'all cannot, uh, you know, I can we give us some extra pay or we are a Fortune 500 company where we look, we dealing with all sorts of LGBT rights and all these different things and diversity and coming out day. I, I think this is an issue that we need to look into. And, and remember, Kendrick, you have not because you asked not. Years okay. ago, when I had my son at Royal Bank, they used to say, um, apply to NIB for the um, check. And they saw that mothers were waiting months and months and months. You had a new baby. You don't have a salary and you're going to NIB. So after so many people um, complained, some people had to come in and get a loan where they was waiting for a NIB to reply or, or to pay the first check. And so Royal Bank said, what we are going to change our policy, we are going to continue paying you for the 13 weeks and trust that you would, when you collect that check, you bring that back into the institution. And so that was a benefit that they offered to the staff. And that helped a lot of pregnant females. Okay, so again, we are not there yet, but other countries are there. And even though we are third um, world country, we have first world status. And these types of benefits are all around the world. It's just that because it's never been done before, or we like to say, oh, but well, when I had my baby, I had to wait. <laughs> these people out of control, they go back to Japan then. That's what we say, right? That's we it don't right there. The box. We That's don't look around. Now. We're not exposed. We think these things are ludicrous. And like I tell you, in Switzerland, you know, my, the first thing my manager said is, Oh my God, Miss Bullard, um, I know you need Thursdays off, but who's going to pick up your kids from school? I said, I know. Yeah, leave from life a key to go up down to pick up my kids. He said, yeah, so do you agree that the mother should leave at, at three? I said, of course. Somebody else was in the corner who don't have parents. Mother see her tree. So the, the, the mother was <laughs> the yeah, That's what has happened. But is, that, is that the case? If that's the case, then the mother should come in earlier, oh, and see. then the person who and then the person who don't have any dependents could come in later. No, it's called work-life balance. balance. Everybody's situation is different. Okay, there may be another area like me. I didn't. I. I. I didn't have um um the entire career. Children going to school. You know, at, at one point, my son was old enough to to pick up my children from school. Okay, so then I no no longer needed that benefit, but I was teaching. So I said, okay, I have no longer, I had no longer enough um, people to um, um, pick up from school, but another institution wants me to come into their office to change, train their staff at 1 p.m. in the day during their lunch hour. I said, oh, sure, okay, you could have the Thursday off. I said, I don't want to come to work for half a day, rush there for one o'clock, be overwhelmed, be saying, hold on, let me pull it, drink some water and catch yourself. They say, okay, we understand. You have not because you ask not. We have not because we have no exposure. But Ms. Fuller, uh, mm, let me just say, uh, from now on, you're an OG, okay? <laughs> okay. In my word, you're an OG. Whatever OG because means. Because original gangster. <laughs> because <laughs> no, the majority of places that I have worked, by even approaching, and it ain't my <laughs> turn to start talking on what I had to deal with because I looked at how downsizing and survival, what they call it? Survivors. Uh, Santa Fe. Uh, yeah, that, that, that right there, because I was a victim of it. Anyway, I'll explain the rest of that. But most of our HR departments, this is just me speaking, they don't have a clue as to what the purpose of HR truly is. That's just my opinion. Approaching um, a subject matter can get you in the hot water. Just approaching a subject matter. And I agree yeah. with you, Kendrick, and this is why we're here, and this is why we're in class, and this is why y'all have an OG for a teacher. So, so y'all, when y'all get to these positions, because we are the future leaders, y'all know how to treat people. Y'all know how to think outside the box. You know how to go online and do research and see what other countries are doing and, and found that their, their staff are more productive. 
they can lessen presenteeism and make more money from absenteeism. Does they even know what those words mean? That, that's the difference when you're trained. Got it. Good. Okay, very good, Denise. Very good. Okay, so who did we say was next? Ms. Bullet talk too long, recruitment, Tanishka. Or Tanishka fall asleep, Ms. Bullet talk too long. I you know, right, Ms. Bullet. <laughs> You're not asleep, Ms. Yes, 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 yes. Wake up. Okay. Yes. So my topic is recruitment and selection. Okay, one second. So what is the difference between recruitment and selection? The difference between recruitment and selection is important to understand. Recruitment refers to process where potential applicants are searched for and then encouraged to apply for an actual or anticipated vacancy. Selection is the process of hiring employees among the shortlisted candidates and providing them a job in the organization. The success of any organization depends on its employees. When an employee is well suited for their job, the entire company can enjoy the benefits of their unbeatable success. Recruitment and selection help organizations choose the, choose the right candidates for the right positions. Therefore, understanding the difference between recruitment and selection is essential to reduce any losses for an organization. Well, okay, what is recruitment? Recruitment is the process in which people are offered selection in an organization. It is when prospective employees are searched for and are then encouraged to apply for jobs within the organization. And the book, the book's definition is the process of locating, identifying, and attracting capable applicants. This is just one step in the process of employment. However, it is a long process that involves a series of tasks starting with an ana analysis of the job requirements and ending with the appointment of the employee. Specific tasks involved, involved in the process of, of recruitment include analyzing job requirements, advertising the vacancy, attracting candidates to apply for the job, managing response, scrutinizing applica application, shortlisting candidates. Recruitment activities are typically performed by human resource practitioners, either internally or externally. Internal recruitment sources are promotion, transfers, retrench employees, con contact or references, ex-employees, retired employees, etc. External recruitment sources are recruitment through advertisement, campus recruitment, recruitment by employee exchanges, recruitment by third parties, internet recruitment, unsolicited application. What is selection? Selection is the process of identifying an individual from a pool of job applicants with the requisite qualifications and competencies to fill job in the organization. This is an HR process that helps differentiate between qualified and unqualified applicants by applying various techniques. The term selection comes with the connotation of placing the right person in the right job. Selection is the process in which various strategies are employed to help recruiters decide which applicant is best suited for the job. Some activities in include screening, eliminating unsuitable candidates, conducting an examination, aptitude tests, intelligence tests, performance tests, personality set tests, et cetera interviews, making references, medical tests. The selection process is largely time consuming, is a largely time consuming step in an employee's hiring experience. HR managers must carefully identify the eligibility of every candidate for the post, being careful not to disregard important factors such as educational qualification, background age, et cetera. So, um, the difference between recruitment and selection. Um, so recruitment activity of searching for potential candidates and encouraging them to apply whereas selection is a process of searching the best candidates. Okay. Recruitment is a process 
aim at attracting more and more job seekers to apply where selection is a negative process. Sorry, recruitment is a positive process. Aim at attracting more and more job seekers to apply where selection is can be seen as negative because they reject and fit candidates from the list. Um, let me see what else. So there are sources. Sorry, I got hit off. You're, you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So that's what I research on Google, but I see too in the book, the book of sources um, that jobs could use to recruit. And then that's like um, employee referrals. And then they also use um, advertisements. That's like what I was discussing. And the book said that employee referrals produce the best candidates because um, they refer, they are referred by current employees. So with that, they know what they're ready in that job. So they know what to expect. So they would also, they would look for people who they know are suitable and also their reputation is at stake. So they, they really would go above and beyond looking for this ideal candidate. And then it's a negative effect to that being that the, talent pool won't be diverse so. Did everybody um encourage their friends and families to apply right yes ma'am right and then they normally give you an incentive like royal bank used to say 250 dollars if you successfully you know if the person passed probation they give you 250 so that was a good incentive for the staff um the only thing i want to say about recruitment in the last couple of you know last year looking in the papers for jobs this was the first time I had seen, um, they said they wanted somebody with a degree, a bachelor's degree, but they said within the last four or five years. And I say, wow, what about the people who got their degree from 1990 and, and uh, you know, 1999? So, I, you know, I thought that was interesting. And so what you want to do is, if you see something like in the, the papers where they say, you know, we don't want, we want the old school people who stuck in their ways and, they are the boss rather than the coach or the mentor. You want to put that you you know these seminars that you attend, um, continuous um, professional um, courses and what have you. Like you're in supervisory skills now, and you may be aiming for the entire ABIFS. So you put currently enrolled, so they know that you are you know in class or staying abreast. So you want to update your CVs and ensure that any of those um, memberships that you are part of, Toastmasters, Rotary, Kiwanis, whatever, civic organizations, you put that in and then put any seminars. Because I, you know, I had to open up an account, with, was it with Morgan Stanley or, over the Christmas for my organization? And they called, they asked me for my um, CV. And then they asked, what seminars that I apply? I told you all that story, right? What seminars that I attend and do many? I was like, but it's a pandemic, how much will it attend any seminars? But of course, you know, I was in some webinars. But, you know, and I was happy that, you know, they said, send us the certificate. They wasn't even taking my word for it. And I was like, could you imagine my institution not being able to open this account because Ms. Bullet didn't attend any seminars in 2020? And they wasn't yeah. even like giving me a, you know, send the seminars you've been in 19, 2019. No, they wanted it for 2020. So, you know, you want to be prepared and, and ensure that you keep abreast. and any webinar, what have you, if you're sending out a new resume, include that so persons know that, you know, even though I have my degree from 1999, you know, I'm still current, I am, you know, up to date and I attend seminars or even I did an upgrading class, you may have had your degree, yes, you know, you have the years of experience, but you did an upgrading class. So make sure when you do apply, you know, these things stand out because you know, I hired a lot of people in my day, and yeah, you always get like at least a hundred um, resumes, and you, you, nobody has time to look through all of them. And so I used to distribute them to my staff, and I say, "Come, y'all have to help me because this person will affect all our lives." So you take um twenty, this one person take you right down to the receptionist. Everybody take twenty, and you all tell me which ones you all like, and we'll we'll interview those people. Okay, so that's what you can do if you want your staff involved. Okay.
And then wow. the personality test. I don't know if you ever applied to Atlantis, but my God, Atlantis had a 45 minute personality test. And one of the problems I um, see, there are two problems with the personality test. First of all, we sit down and we tell people what they want to hear. We know we don't like certain things, but we, we tell the people what they want to hear. And so we basically you know, tell the truth on the personality test, and then we get placed in client facing positions when we are introverts. And then we get back office when we are extroverts because we didn't put the correct thing on the personality test. The next problem I see is that, guess where the personality test is sick? Right, nature. So the manager never ever sees it, does not know that Miss Bullet is an extrovert, does not know that, you know, the HR just keep all that good information. And when Miss Bullet started to act up and have these little issues, you know, the manager just don't know what to do. Then the manager go into HR and say, did something go wrong? Can I see her CV or no? no. So when you hire these people, ensure that you have their CV, you have a full file of good stuff. You got information that will help you, you know, give you some tips on how to type of personality the person has. And, you know, and so you know, make it flow each day. They gather all this information and throw it in the desk and nobody ever uses it. So that's my two pet peeves with um, personality. Okay? Okay, good. Any other questions or concerns? Oh. No? Okay, good. Um, who is next? Um, Kendrick, downsizing. And Kendrick, I before you start, and you know, I try not to talk so much. But let's look at page 131 at the top. And I just want to consider this. It says, victims of downsizing are not those employees who were let go. Rather, the victims are the ones who have kept their jobs. Do you agree or disagree? So I don't know which aspect you took it from, but you go. And then at the end, we'll talk about that of the class. Everybody else. Let, let me hit that up now, if I could do that real quick. I do think in some 131. ways. 131. At the top. Um, at the now. very top. Uh -huh. Victims victims are, of downsizing are not those employees who were let go. Rather, the victims rather the victims are the ones who have the kept stick. their job. Mm -hmm. Because I agree with that. And here's why I agree with that. Whenever you see that they're... Okay, I'll use myself as an example. I worked at one of the clearing banks for a few years. And at one particular point, there was, at the end of the month, every person on staff knew that people were being fired and let go. And it appeared that this particular institution had actually targeted their own. I came in in regards to an acquisition. They acquired our bank, and most of you should have figured it out by now. And what had transpired. At the end of the month, everybody knew that two to three people were going to lose their jobs. And what had happened is that it created anxiety in the staff. Not only did it create anxiety, what you found is that people actually withdrew themselves in regards that I'm only going to do what the minimum per se. That, that was the effect of that. So morale went low and then people basically clammed up because everybody knew that at the end of the month, somebody that they worked with or somebody that they knew, if only by name, was no longer going to be employed. And that destroyed morale in that particular institution. And when it, is, when it destroyed the morale, it basically um, did a lot of the staff in because there was no longer any Comfort per se, it became very uncomfortable coming to work. Okay, that's good, Ms. Fuller. That's good. Okay, all right. Um, page 116 How does a supervisor handle layoffs? In the past decade, most large US corporations, as well as government agencies and small businesses, have been forced to shrink the size of their workforce or restructure their skill composition. Downsizing has become a relevant means of meeting the demands of a dynamic environment. What are the what are what are a supervisor's downsizing options? 
obviously people can be let go, but other choices may be more beneficial to the organization. Exhibit 5-4 summarizes a supervisor's major downsizing options. But keep in mind, regardless of the method chosen, employees suffer. We must we discuss the phenomena for employees, both victim and survivors later in the chapter. One of the first aspects is firing, laying offs, or firing being a permanent uh, involuntary termination, layoffs temporary and invol involuntary termination may last only a few days or extend for years, furloughs, I guess. Uh, attrition, not filling openings created by voluntary resignations or normal retirement. That seems to be very popular in our country. Uh, transfers, moving employees either laterally or downward usually does not reduce the cost, but can reduce intra-organizational supplies, demand imbalances, reduce week, work weeks, having employees work fewer hours per week, share jobs, or perform their jobs on a part-time basis, early retirement providing incentives to older and more senior employees for retiring, before their normal retirement, retirement date and job sharing. Having employees, typically two part-timers, uh, share one full-time position. Now, and I guess for me, Ms. Bullard, I would ask you a question. Do you think in the Bahamas, and I mean it's open for the class as well, that attrition is a big thing in the Bahamas? Do I think it's a, when you say it's a big thing? Because what do you mean? The, the, the reason why I ask is that, okay, we have this thing called sundry duties, right? And apparently every institution has it. So, and I think this is where most institutions get into trouble because they don't have any segregation of duties. Whatever I want you to do, you go and do. Uh, because there are persons who resign and a company will take forever, even though there's a tremendous workload on the others trying to pull a load to hire people. And when I read this, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna ask Ms. Bullard, what she think about this? In, in your working, in, in your vast work experience, have you seen a lot of this? Okay, so what I've seen is that older staff members, we're still doing everything manually, right? And so they weren't replaced by bodies, but they were replaced by systems and efficiencies. Okay. Because right. would you say attrition, right? When, you know, persons are retiring, but they're not replaced. Or yeah. people resign and they're not replaced. Not so, replaced. Right, yeah. So I saw it where they... Um, replaced it with efficiencies or with 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 systems not that there you know there wasn't a body but you know they are either combined in the department or they um had a system you know because we have had i i mean i've had persons who did not know how to use the computer only know how to do everything manually and and we held on to them because they was there for, for forever you know, and they were the historians in the the, the, the the company. And so really we were just giving them a salary. You okay. know, other than if we needed to know some history, that that, that was my um experience. Okay. Um, I was also a part when um Trinidad bought Royal Bank and they didn't wanna take on Finco and so Finco said that Royal Bank would, you know, take on some of the processes and that did not work. And they immediately let a hundred staff go and there was only 29 left. <laughs> so those 29 that were left, they, 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 they didn't catch from that yet. And, and that's, it's, all the processes stayed, 
Royal Bank was not able to carry it on. And as you can see, this, the service is, has dwindled. Yeah, because I mean, I know that I mean, this may be somebody else's section in regards to survivors, but I, what has transpired with me, I got hurt on the job working for that same institution after somebody else was involved in an accident. I got in an accident as well. And next thing I know, I had a broken ankle, two surgeries, and was laid up for about January 29th to a return back to work May 15th of that year. And May 30th, they called me in office and told me they no longer need my services. And that's what I faced. And for me personally, and I usually tell this to everybody, so I don't have a problem saying it. On that particular day, loyalty died. What I grew up knowing, knowing to be loyalty to a workplace, as a young man, I said it died that particular day because you can, when I got hurt, I was supposed to be off. And here I was actually doing the company going above and beyond, got hurt. And then the company, as soon as I got back off, uh, back to work, was recovering from two surgeries. They said they no longer needed my services and that was it. So you said me, you work you worked at the Finco and I don't I don't know you. No, I never worked at Finco. I oh. never even, I, I, nev I never applied to Royal Bank. I thought oh, about okay. it. I thought about it, but, but no, I thought you said that's where you got hurt on the job. No. I got hurt on the job. I did get oh, hurt on the job. On the job. I thought you said that's the exact institution where I got hurt. No, no. The same okay. institution is where, you know, where I went above and beyond. And I ended up losing my job and it was a when I tell you when your leg is straight but your foot is hanging off to the opposite side it's not a pleasant experience and to think of all the pain and the anguish that I went through trying to go above and beyond I don't think any employer will ever get that out of me you will get yeah, somebody but, who will come to work and who will bust his behind and do his work yeah but Kendrick I I am certain it was a horrendous experience and nobody should have been treated that way but I pray that, you know, in other organizations that the persons are trained and they will help you establish that, you know, that loyal feeling again. I, I cause they are, like I say, I, I was eight months pregnant and mm -hmm. using the bathroom and the door, the bathroom door fell on my foot and it, it broke my foot. Wow. Okay. And the ambulance had to come. And um, they took me and they were more concerned. The person from HR, but I mean, and she was previously my manager. So she left at her, her office. They took me directly to the doctor's hospital. She came, she stayed there, she prayed with me and, you know, and they were very concerned about the baby. And then they actually, I mean, the carpenter or the person who was responsible for the building say, I tell them to change that door a long time. You you only sue them me. And I mean, they was like saying they would hire me a lawyer and everything to say, you know, compensate me. But I, I was compensated, you know. Yeah, I was and compensated. I did get, like industrial benefit and everything for the time I was off with my broken leg. So I just think you had a bad experience with an untrained person. Country and organization, they should, I would say. Correct, because somebody else should have stepped in and said, no way, this is not happening. What are we doing for Kendrick or, you know? And definitely, um, we, he has to keep his job and he recovers. Yeah, I, I understand 100% why you feel that way, but I pray that you have a better experience. I, I kept it for about 15 days after coming back to work. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> okay. They didn't want to make it immediate. That still doesn't, no. you know what I mean? Yeah, they, they are wrong, 100% wrong for that. Um, my next, you, you have anything else or I could go on? No, you could go on now. Okay, go yeah. On. So my next experience with downsizing <laughs> again. Sorry? Somebody else said something? No? Okay. So I had another experience with downsizing. And again, um, I just want to share with you so you don't... Um, do this to anybody. Um, when I was at Royal Bank, we um, 
we were being sued for an account that we had at the French government was suing us and Royal Bank decided to close up the trust department to avoid the reputational risk because again, Royal Bank has five other entities outside of the trust. And so we, we closed down. And so they announced to us one year before they closed, they um, brought in people to help us write our resumes they, across Royal Bank, every position that was available, they gave us first preference and they shortlisted us. And we were allowed to go to those um, into, um, you know, interviews because some persons had been there for 30 years and they was like, you know, this is a part of their life. They can't, you know, not work or, and they don't, you know, another lady, she was crying. She was like, she did not want to leave. I want another hand, it's like, I want money don't send me on no interview. I don't need nobody to do my resume because I don't want no job to mess this up for me. So, you know, it depends on who you are. Different people feel different ways about it. And then they offered us counseling. Um, they offered us, you know, if we wanted to stay on the retail side at the same salary, we were able to. Um, there was just so, so, so many benefits. And so in the last months, about at least six months, we showed up to, to work and we handed over our processes to the people who were going to be there last or you know to, to canada or to um barbados or the cayman and to me it was just an overall um good atmosphere and everybody was supportive and you know everybody got a package so everybody was happy now i went to another organization where um I was just doing an audit and they said, can you excuse out of the boardroom because we're carrying out a downsizing exercise. So I was like, okay. And they say, oh, you could just sit in the corner, one corner on it, you know, I was like, okay, shouldn't this be private? But anyway, they invited like six persons into the boardroom and somebody stood up and said, um, we've decided not to keep you all any longer. Um, could you return to your desk and um, pack up your stuff and your access has already been turned off on the system? And I, I, I was in shock. And then each manager went with one of those persons and stood over them as if they had stole and, and packed them up. And they, and they were given severances and everything, but this is just a, the way it was handled. And they stood over them and they said, pack up your desk, pack your bag. And these, you know, one of the two of the ladies was crying. And one of those <laughs> ladies was there for 30 years. And I was like, should this be handled like this? I mean, did they steal? I mean, are you giving them a severance? What was, you know? And even if somebody steals, you you still don't, you don't talk to people that way. Um, the people are very emotional. You don't stand over them and act like one minute they was, the manager of this and now they're the chief. You know, I just thought it was just handled so poorly and, and it really, really ruined reputations with the staff that remained because they was like, oh my God, I could, you know, I could be next. Well, then you know? I, wa I watched that happen where they actually brought the police in and this person was not violent, disruptive or anything. That was just not in their demeanor. And I saw the patrol car out to you know and i'm like but but did the, the person steal no nope, didn't it steal was didn't do any i think most people and like i said it goes back to the institution that you work for um for me that was disturbing personally for me when i saw it because i know the person and to me i'm like that person ain't even like that a place in from no hood or nothing like that a place in even yeah. place, they voice like I mean, to me that was it was you know it was disturbing to me yeah. disturbing you know, please be, please be compassionate because, you know, over a lifespan, somebody will lose a loved one, somebody will get sick, they will lose a job, it could be any one of us. Look at what's happening in the, the hotel, it's a lot of persons all at once. Please always be compassionate. I mean, even if the person steals, like, police come, please always think that this could be me or my child or what have you, you want to follow policy and there's no way in the policy says that you have to be rude. Or, or embarrass the person. And especially if the person is in shock, like these people were in shock. 
you know, and in my audit, I wrote, I wrote, I left a very long note in my audit saying that the culture of that organization had to change and they needed to go to training. Because in my life, I, I, I was in shock. I was, I almost cried and I was sorry. I even had to witness something like that. So please, please, there's no reason why you cannot you know, uh, compassionately, and then you never know when it's going to be you, okay? And this is why I say be proactive, um, have at least five revenue streams, make sure one is essential, make sure one is online. And so when these things happen, I mean, they will hit hard, but you can still survive. Okay, so prepare yourselves. And even up with retirement, I see so many persons who are 65 and they are ailing, and they have to come to work because their mortgage isn't paid off. So start now, uh, you know, um, some of us have 30 years and left before retirement. We don't want to just, oh, my children can take care of me or, or what have you. We don't want to be, you know, dependent. So even if you save $25, you know, in some insurance, mutual fund, something, do some type of investment. So when you retire, you don't have to hold on to these jobs, plug up the system so the young people don't get an opportunity or, you know, continuously do things um, manually. Okay, so let, let's be proactive and plan for ourselves. Okay, good. Very, very, very good. Um, Kendrick, anybody else wanted to add or be good? Is Billy talking now? I guess so. I guess so. Okay, Roseanne, performance um, appraisal. Performance appraisal. Um, it is important for supervisors to get their employees to behave in, in ways that the organization considers desirable. How do, how do managers ensure that employees are, are performing as, as they are supposed to in, in organizations, the formal means of assessing work of, of of employees is through a system systematic performance appraisal process. So we we would go on and look at this in chapter twelve. Well, basically, a performance appraisal is a evaluation of the of the employer's work. Um, it goes. I, I, I have worked for a company before. Depending on your work appraisal, they will go against bonuses if they would give you bonuses. If you are trying to go into a different area in the company, they would go against that too. Okay. That's it, Rosa? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just a short um, overview. You know, we covered it in, in chapter 12 on um, performance appraisals and the various different errors that can occur um, with supervisors. Um, you want to ensure that it's fair. You want to ensure that, you know, I've heard that some people say, well, Ms. Bullard, I don't even have a job description or my job description does not match what I do. And so you know, if you take this to your manager and your manager, you know, you can't say Miss Joan and you still don't even have a job description that matches what you do, then you go, you know, bring in HR and say, listen, I, she, he or she needs some help with this to properly document what I am going to be graded on at the end of the year. Because my bonus is attached to this and I only work in three, I go in above and beyond for the bonus, right? And so you want to make sure that you don't wait around that you don't set goals you, you know you ask people so have you set your goals what are one of your goals um are they smart goals and you no know, miss bullet being set no goal and be already in march so i know sometimes the supervisors are overworked and overwhelmed and so you know if you sometimes you supervise up you know you say i wrote these goals what do you think when you have some time look at it and i want to ensure that these are the goals that i'm going to be um graded against at the end of the year okay so those appraisals are very important. And when you're giving an appraisal, like I say, use the sandwich approach. Say something good, start off something good, not just with complaints because everybody has value. You know, say the tough parts in the middle, 
you know, you have HIV, so Denise said we must fire you, and then you go back to her, but we're going to find a solution and not let you go. Right, Denise? <laughs> Denise so you're cold, boy. <laughs> I didn't say all that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right on, Denise. And uh, full bonus. Yeah, right, say all right that. Denise? Uh, so we last. can make sure I buy all your pills so you never get sick. Right. Uh -oh, no, only this time. Only this time. Yeah, yeah. So make sure, make sure, um, you know, in halfway through, if Miss Bullet fall and all, well, Miss Bullet decides I know Miss Bullet, you know, we have to meet these goals. You were supposed to open up 10 accounts. There's already June and you want to open up none. So it looked like you're gonna meet this 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 um goal, you know, and then Miss Bullet said, but it's a pandemic. So can we remove this goal? No. Okay, let's make it more reasonable. Let's drop it to five. And then Ms. Bullock can really push, okay? So sometimes, like I say, life happens, uh, the, the economy happens, the a pandemic, you know, you have to adjust those, okay? Don't sit and wait till it's too late, okay? Um, anybody else wants to add to that? No? Okay, good. Um, that was Roseanne. Now it's Yuri. Compensation and benefits. I concentration. Compensation and benefit. Now, uh, well, from from what the introduction, from what the introduction um, states, we know that all of us basically come to uh, most of us work for money, and comp and, and compensation and benefits defined as what our job pay is and what benefits we receive as employees. Um, also, the determination of salary decision and benefit to the employee is out of the direct supervisor's hands. So, since that is since that is being said, we now have to figure out who decides how we get paid, who, who decides how much we get paid, and the salary that we receive. So, compensation administration is defined as the process of determining a cost-effective pay structure that will. That will attract and retain competent employees, provide an incentive for them to work hard, and ensure that pay levels will be perceived as fair. Now, with this definition, like the latter part of it, I personally don't agree with, especially where they say an incentive for them to work hard, because I believe to be a part of a to be a part of a company, you should be working smart and not hard. So I don't know what y'all um I'll take us on that and ensure that pay levels will be perceived as fair. Uh, so when when they say how pay levels are determined, who who is the direct supervisor doesn't decide how we get paid? Who actually decides our cost? Will that be like the shareholders or stakeholders? Well, that's a question that you're asking, Yuri? Yeah. Okay, so what happens is, um, in the Bahamas, you know, in the States, they have all these boards and these equal pay and make sure minimum wage and everything is, um, I guess, at a certain level. But, you know, we have minimum wage. Um, we have the, oh, Lord, what's the organization? It's an association. Um, Anastasia Johnson, she is the executive director. What she did is she went to all of the finance, you know, the entire financial services sector as the association, and she did a pay scale, um, or what should I say? Yeah, a pay scale depending on, you know, the years of experience, what educational background you had, and your age, you know. And so she did this um, analysis on across the Bahamas on what each institution would pay and what would be considered fair. Now, I was at Royal Bank for most of my years. So of course, you know, our um, salary is, comes down from Canada. So I would imagine that, you know, they did a, an assessment based on the Bahamas because, you, you know, and this, this information was privileged, you know, it was on our, we had an internet, you could go on the internet and you could see if you worked at um, Royal Banks and Kits, um, or Cayman or Trinidad, whatever, all of these um, salaries were posted across. And for the most part, you always saw that the Bahamas was paid way more than what Trinidad was paid or, or some of the other Eastern Caribbean um, countries. 
And so that came down from, I can't tell you what analysis um, um, Royal Bank would have done, but of course they, it would have been based on the economy and with minimum wages and, and what have you. But I think it's Bahamas Financial Services Board did one on behalf of the sector and each HR um, could go and pay $300 and go and get, you know, it will show you what was a competitive rate at, at a certain level. Now, when I um, was uh, with Royal Bank downsized and I was let go, the labor board came in, of course, and they wanted to see the amounts that um, uh -huh. each person was going to be paid. And Royal Bank was told, uh, with my degree and my years of experience and what have you, my payout was $20,000 less than the government would allow them to pay me, okay? And so they um, had to increase it or they could not let me go. And so Royal Bank then said, we're gonna give you a bonus of $20,000 because okay. you've been such an excellent employee for the last few years. You're right, oh. but of course, after they said that to me, because this was Canada having that conversation, they sent back, all of the information and I was a manager anyway. So I saw where it was the labor board that said, with my degree and my years and what have you, this is what my salary should have been. And this is what they should have paid me. I wish the labor board had come in sooner. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> yeah. But and I, I was I was quite content with my, you know, I speak highly of Royal back in the day. But anyway, um such as <laughs> but yeah, so that's what happened. But so um, most organizations go to Bahamas Financial Services Board. They pay the 300 and they get this, this. And she has promised to update it, you know, because of inflation and whatever, every three years. And so they pay for it to ensure that they, um, everybody has a fair salary. But it's not fair because to me, Royal Bank still went below what the industry had, you know, what the industry was paying. So it, it just depends. And another issue that I had with Royal Bank was that in order for you, you know, they did employee opinion surveys on the managers. And if you didn't get like the, the benchmark for every survey was 75%. If you got below 75%, you, you needed improvement, okay? And so if I'm a manager and the benchmark is 75% for my customer service survey, as well as my employee opinion survey, then that means I should at least be paid within 75% of the range. And, and, and it was just, that, that's what Royal Bank put out, the range, the salary ranges. And so I calculated my salary one year and I told, I told um, Canada, listen, y'all, the minimum I can get is 75% or I would be let go or needs improvement. I am getting 87% overall, which is an outstanding rating. So therefore, my salary should be 87% of the range. My salary is 63% of the range. So I had argued that for years, you know, because just the, the standard that they held me to for the surveys, it should be the same standard I paid at, right? Yeah, but I had to row over that for years. But anyway, in the end, Thank God for the labor board. They saw that same analogy. I, I probably left them a little note and say, how about this? Look at this labor board. And I definitely did get my 87% in my package. That's why I was screaming for it and say, let me go, let me go. I need that money. Yeah. But now I need that money again. But then that's a little story. That's a little story. Mm -hmm. Y'all gotta shut me up. I, you know, I'll run on forever. You finish your read, that's it. No, 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 no. I don't okay. have me there. Um, oh, you have so, me. Oh, sorry. Sorry for running on. Miss Belinda, you talk no more. Go ahead. No, no, no. That's fine. So, as as you know, our expectation is when, when we enter into the, the workforce, the higher we acquire skills, the, the, higher, the higher knowledge that we receive, and the higher the ability that we achieve, that we should get, our pay should be higher. So other factors that come into a pay for salary termination um, should be considered when the following is involved. 
that and positive. Then, Jack, I know I promised I wasn't going to say anything else, but is it true that you will get this ABIFS, but you got to leave because your institution ain't going to pay you more unless you fight for it? Is that still the premise that we have to leave and apply that once we get a new degree or upgrade or something? Will our institution automatically say, okay, you got your associate's degree, they're not going to pay you at a higher level? Or is the premise still that I got to leave and go to somewhere else for them to pay me for that degree? As I'm employed, I don't think we, I don't think I experienced that. I think once you can present that, once you can present your papers, that you like achieve like higher knowledge, you're eligible for an increase. Okay, they will increase it. Okay, well, okay, yeah. see what, see, hopefully, see what happens in December. <laughs> no, I mean, that's when it happens. You, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. on your performance appraisal, because you know they ask you for feedback. So this is where you wrote. This is where you write. I completed supervisory skills, this, that, that. I am 90% completed with the, the ABIFS. And so all of that should help them beef up the money, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and say, I don't want to feel like I have to leave <laughs> to be paid, for, you know? Anyway, they're saying, no, don't put that. But just put, you know, the accolades and, and what you accomplished. Okay, good. Right. Go ahead. I ain't saying nothing. No, I know problem. Uh, the factors come into place is found in determination where the following is involved. So that's positive condition. So the book gave an example of like persons who work on bridges where their lives could be in danger. Unusual, unusual hours where that can be like early in the morning or late at night. So like, for example, I guess like in the pandemic, I know like persons like military and like security officers, I know they had to work like a medical, like medical staff. Like they had to work like nonstop. So their pay should have been increased, but I can't speak for them because I'm not, I'm not sure they got like pay raises. Yes, but if they, they didn't get like an actual pay raises or pay different, I know they would get like a benefit, like a hazardous pay. Yeah, they pay, were right? promised hazardous pay up to $5,000, but right. I think they had to go and protest to get it. I don't know if they got it. Does that but include super made... value? No, that <laughs> the government promised. Um, the nurses and the doctors. Now, super value yeah. is private. It's not unionized. It's private. Rupert Roberts decides for them. And apparently, he treats them well because they voted a few times that they don't want a union because he is fair. Oh, wow. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy, 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 crazy. Yeah. They voted on it at least three or four times and they voted against having a union because they said he is very fair, Um, I guess, when it comes to compensation and benefits. Wow. Yeah, shocker. I repeat my previous statement. Crazy. Yeah. But I don't support unions anyway because many can have one, one can have many. You know, I don't I don't support that. The union bosses are are, you know, living in these mansions and, and sitting in this nice air conditioned office and all the workers going to work and paying them. You know, it's fifty two dollars a week and eight thousand. They are billionaires and the only thing you could do is give me representation if if I am victimized on a job. I mean, I see some other benefits coming through the banks, but I, I don't support unions. I'd rather save my $52 a week in my own bank account, get interest or invest it in the stock, and then use that if I need legal representation. Many can have one, one can have many. Think about it. Sorry, Yuri, go ahead. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, geographical location, uh, like metropolitan areas. So to give an example, they compare New York and Arizona. So like the cost of living, the cost of living differs between the two. So jobs may pay higher in the metropolitan areas than in the rural areas. And so I just brought it back to home. Um, like the metropolitan area would be considered like in the city where you could just receive like our base salary and maybe like overtime, like overtime bonus. Whereas where persons who like leave the metropolitan areas and work in neighboring islands, they would get like salaries, they would get like other other like pay incentives, like living, um, meals, like especially like those construction workers. Like you can see like advertisements like in the papers where they say if you take the job, you'll taste your your living, your transit well, yeah, yeah, your living causes, and I guess you may get like 
like little price and all the way, and then seniority. So long time service employees receive like salary increments on an annual basis. Um, benefits, benefits are defined as non-financial rewards designed to enrich employee, employee lives. So uh, the text describes most organizations offer social security, so that'd be NIV equivalent, uh, paid time off from work, life and disability insurance, and retirement and pension retirement and pension programs. So be advised companies decide on how the cost of benefits are determined by split percentages. So I know in where I'm employed, uh, most of our like our health, like our health insurance is like 80. 80, 80 where the employee pays and then 20 percent uh the employee pays but i think like others like i know for like bahama for sure they like pay 100 percent like the employer pays like 100 percent so i don't know if anybody else want to share like how their employers like have their benefits in regards to the insurance that's if they provide any like how is that split how the how the percentage is split the most part, um, Urea is eighty twenty. The, the the financial services sector gets a good benefit on insurance. Okay. Oh yeah, that's what they clear for me. Yeah. Okay, so very good, very good. And I put my bits and pieces in the middle of that. Okay, so good. So again, my whole thing is if the organization offers a benefit. It's two folds now, it's two sides of every story. We don't want to take advantage of it, but we also do not want to make people feel like they are doing something wrong for accepting the meal allowance or accepting the overtime. Okay? Just just that reminder. Okay, excellent. And I I, I just feel very good and, and this is, you know, what I expected and, and I, I'm very happy um, you know, of the collaboration and the discussion. That um that we're having so so good job, very good. Um, that was Yuri Margaret interviewing. The interview process and in prepar. So I wrote something down. So I just recited in preparation for the interview. This involves developing lists and tasks acquired by the job and lists of skills and experience acquired for the position. This is your guide during the interview process. In doing this, you can prepare and conduct multiple interviews for different positions at the same time. Um, always keep in mind that all interview questions should be job related. Do not ask questions that are not job related. So, question, so asking these kinds of questions, you will, you will or may be able to determine the candidate's qualifications by stating the conditions and requirements for the job. Ensure and the, on the, the last part is how to ensure to inject federal, state, and local guidelines regarding employment regulations, which I'm assuming to translate to the Bahamas would be probably um, ensure to check, I guess, NIB and um, labor laws. That would be probably our, more, um, our employment regulations here in the Bahamas. And also consult an attorney or your legal department for the hiring process, as I know some companies do. Um, the book also talks about um, questions you should and should not ask during the interview process, such as um, the applicant's family or, his, or their marital status, um, the ages of their kids, um, their height and weight questions, um, questions regardless of them being a homeowner or a rental own person, um, questions relate to the person's arrest record, Questions concern um, and concerns about pregnancy, you should not ask. Um, you can't, and the question you should ask, you could ask them questions related to travel, unusual hours over time. Um, see, identifying communication skills, emotional maturity and behaviors, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay. Okay. Good. Again, you want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want to make it as conversational as possible when you go on interviews, whether you go or you are the interviewer, you want to make the person as comfortable, you don't want to intimidate them, you, you know, so, you know, start off with a little conversation to try and break the ice. Um, a lot of, you know, institutions ask, what do we, you know, about 
this company? And or why would you want to work? So most of these companies have a website. You go on Google, Google, get some information about, you know, um, their events. You know, you, you know, you could say, I, I, I saw that Royal Bank celebrated 108 years of um, existence in the Bahamas. Congratulations. You know, you could say stuff like that. Um, don't try and, you know, remember or rehearse a lot of stuff, but just, a, you know, something to break the ice. And like I said, eye contact is very important. And again, stay, stay on in line with the job description, you know, and um, who, who trying to find out the person's personality. Don't be intrusive. Don't make them uncomfortable. Don't ask, you know, the book gives a good, um, what you should ask versus what you shouldn't ask. And then remember, again, you know, give people a chance, you know, because a lot of times people are, um, um, you know, afraid or they're a bit nervous and, and, and always make sure that you are dressed appropriately. No matter where it is you go in um, on an interview, you, you, you know, where you, you should have one nice suit, you know, what is your interview suit and you, you keep it clean and pressed and because and first impressions are, are lasting and make sure your hair is done nicely and your, um, you, you know, if you don't wear makeup, don't wear makeup, but, you know, don't overdo it. One time, and, 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 you know, this might be wrong, Miss Bullard, but this lady, her nail polish was chipped. And her hand, <laughs> like, it's like she had on that nail polish for like three years. And I just couldn't get past her, her nail <laughs> polish. So please, try to take all the polish off or make sure that the nails are really manicured because I, I just couldn't even pay attention. That's too wrong intense. age. I was too wrong intense. Age. Well, that's too uh, intense, Mark. No, I just oh. couldn't get past it. It was like, so, it's like, did you even watch that? I was, said, nah, babe. That was the <laughs> first thing. I said, nah, babe. That's it right there. That's it right there, right? I said, nah, babe. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all don't have like pet peeves like that. Like, I, I just couldn't oh, look back. But listen. Oh, I when no, I, I, I was like. Uh, yeah, I have one. I just don't know if you have HIV or not. Just... Oh. <laughs> don't have it's a about a joke. It. It's about a joke. <laughs> that is not an appropriate answer. <laughs> uh, the appropriate question now, that is not appropriate. Yeah, but I couldn't I couldn't see past her nails. Um, when I first got hired the trust, I used to have a very heavy, what do you call those charm bracelets? And my manager said, do you know I almost didn't hire you because of that charm bracelet? Did you not wear that to work? And I was like, how dare you? And he's like, miss, you speak with your hands and you was just showing that hand up and those bracelets, that those charms were just clackling, clackling. And he said it was, it was so um, 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 disturbing. I couldn't even pay attention. He needed a life. That's what, yeah, that's what he said, my charm, you know? So I don't know if I get, get you know, after we came close, he told me, he almost denied me because of my job face in the clashing. So I, I didn't hire her because of her nail polish. And I, I, I couldn't see past it. So I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah. That's awful of me. God forgive me. God forgive me. Oh, my God. Oh my God. First, first impressions are lasting though. Yeah, yeah. I was like, if you showing up to any and really you couldn't afford an acetone to take it off or or you know, we think you're deep though. No, deep, man. I said, nah, boy. I sorry, I sorry. I was deep, <laughs> No, man. I, I oh, gee. Oh, gee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So be careful. Just make sure you look your best. Look your best. I better make okay. sure my shoe polish on the bottom, even. Yeah, and, and guess yeah. what? A lot of men, a lot of men especially, um, you know, gay men, they want you to look a certain way. They you know, if you don't have on those ha those heels and that suit, I can tell you uh, that, that's another thing. My my um, you know, in discussions so, when I started hiring, he say, but she didn't even wear a suit, or he wore a suit, but he didn't have on a tie, and you know, you know what I mean, stuff like that. I wasn't impressed. Red bottoms, red bottoms. Yeah, yeah be be careful, be be careful. Make sure you look your best, and make a good first impression, mm. and ask the right questions. Okay, good, uh, very very good. Okay, Fabian harassment, sexual harassment. This is a big, big thing now all around the world. For years, we hit it. Um, and again, it's the book only talks about sexual harassment, on the exam, or sexual harassment. But there are a lot of harassments 
within organizations. And in Royal Bank, it was so bad till we had to put in our code of conduct, code of conduct that there it should be no type of harassment based on age, race, disability. If you win this click versus the next click, if you were part of the great bank, we had to put it in writing. Um, because we handed out, you know, we put people on um um probation and stuff over the constant bickering, the constant harassing, the the the, the constant opposing or co constant opposition. Okay, so don't just think of sexual harassment, but I did do look up um on the internet and it said from 2010 to 2016. 45% of women said that they were harassed at work and 15% men said they were harassed in the workplace. And again, as you know, supervisors or HR, 15%, when men come and say that they are harassed, we do not want them to feel like they are weak. Okay? And we want to open door policy where they are comfortable that they won't be judged or called any other name because they would have reported it. Okay, so Fabian, I don't want to take up all your time, but I have one more story when you finish, so, so go ahead. Fabian? Um, sexual harassment is a type of harassment involving the use of explicit or implicit- Could you speak up a little bit, please? You're very low. Can you all hear? I can't hear you. Sexual harassment is a type of harassment involving the use of explicit or implicit sexual overtones, including the unwelcome or inappropriate promise of rewards in exchange for sexual favors. Sexual harassment includes a range of actions from verbal transgressions to sexual abuse or assault. Sexual harassment results in millions lost in absenteeism, low productivity and turnovers. Sexual harassment can be regarded as any unwanted activity of a sexual nature that affects an individual's employment. It can occur between members of both opposite sex or of the same sex, between employees of the organization or employee and a non-employee. Sexual harassment is considered illegal in most modern legal contexts. Laws surrounding and most modern legal, sorry, laws surrounding this does not prohibit simple teasing, offhand comments or minor isolated incidents. In the workplace, harassment may be considered illegal when it is frequent or severe, thereby creating a hostile or offensive work environment or when it results in an adverse employment decision such as demotion, firing or quitting. Sexual harassment by an employer is a form of illegal employment discrimination. Dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace, there are numerous ways to deal with such. The first step is to take, the first step to take is to follow your company's procedures, which can normally be found in the code of conduct before reporting sexual harassment. And you can do this by following your chain of command, manager, HR, or via whistleblower. Okay, okay, that's it? Sorry, whenever involved in a sexual harassment matter, a supervisor must remember that the harasser may have rights also. This means that no action should be taken against someone until a thorough investigation has been conducted. Furthermore, the results of the investigation should be reviewed by an independent and objective individual before any action against the alleged harasser is taken. Even then, the harasser should be given an opportunity to respond to the allegation and have a disciplinary hearing of, if desired. Additionally, an avenue for appeal should exist for the alleged harasser and appeal heard by someone in a higher level of management who is not associated with the case. Okay, great, great. So I don't know if we have had these instances um, of course, a lot of times persons have not spoken up, but as we see in recent, um, you know, last two years, there's this Me Too um, advocate group um, and more persons are speaking out and they are talking about being harassed for more than 20 or 30 years. And I know, you know, some people who were, you know, victim of an, an evangelist 
And the, one of the institutions that I worked at, the messenger, older gentleman, he was there for 35 years. And he was, you know, he retired with all his accolades and standing next to an older member of staff, um, you know, she gets stood up and she said, I cannot believe that he lasted for 35 years when, you know, he sexually harassed me, he touched me inappropriately and what have you, you know, a few other girls. And then some 10, 15 years later, he inappropriately, you know, somebody walked on him, and, you know, touching somebody inappropriately and, you know, she did a loud outburst and you know, person just said, had the older member of staff or the persons who he first affected reported it, perhaps the younger girls, it would not have happened to. But, it, he, you know, he lasted the entire 35 years. He was a well-respected member of staff. And, and nobody ever, you know, made one report um, of him touching them inappropriately, you know. And so that lady just stood there and said, wow, you know, she is surprised. But, and that's happening in many organizations. Um, I also worked at, um, you know, I worked with an evangelist who was very, very inappropriate to the women, saying all sorts of sexual um, comments. And, and, you know, he was older, you know, they, could, they would just hit him, you know, when he tried to touch them, but he's an evangelist, you know? So um, this is widespread um, all over the world, not just happening. Um, in the Bahamas. So we want women and men to, you know, be aware of their code of conduct. But, you know, COVID causes us to stay six feet apart, stay six feet apart. Um, um, you know, if you think it's going to be uh, inappropriate, don't do it. Don't get too close. Um, um, be mindful of, you know, the little jokes that we crack in the office and the little topics that we talk about, because sometimes persons take it you know, we may be laughing, but when this, the joke is on us, we, we take it personally. And there have been some women um, who um, have falsely accused men, you know, of sexually harassing them. So ju just to stay on the safe side, you know, just stay the six feet apart and make sure you don't rub against or touch any anybody inappropriately. Okay, I had a CEO, he was one of the CEOs who used to crack all the little, you know, off the wall jokes. And when the Me Too movement came out, he was afraid to get in the elevator. He said, oh, I'm not going to get in the elevator with any woman. I take the stairs. And so if there was like a group of women, we came from a meeting, he said, go ahead, I'll take the stairs. Oh, no, I'm afraid. You know, he used to say that he was afraid, but he was one of those who said a lot of the inappropriate things. So. Like I say, because, you know, it's at the forefront now and a lot of people are being prosecuted, make sure that, you know, you're not caught in any of these inappropriate situations because I'm certain after the investigation, you may, you know, lose your job and lose your career. It's, it's, it's not worth it. Okay, find people who <laughs> want to date you and you make all those advances at that, at, at that person. And that's men and women because... I've seen a lot of older women who are cougars harass little young boys and, and that, you know, people turn a blind eye. And of course, the man, you know, the boy does not want to feel weak. So he will not report that, you know? So it is two ways. We may think it's only women, but it, it's both ways. Okay. Any other comments or concerns? Um, I'll share a small comment. I mean, I just read um, recently that, um, I, I don't know if any guys familiar with Looney Tunes. I don't know if you remember the character with the uh, the skunk who well, always used to chase after the um chase after the cat. Pepe Le Pew. Um, right. Pepe Le Pew, right. So um they're now releasing the sequel for Space Sham 2, where LeBron James is starring and they're not uh, and they're not including Pepe Le Pew in it because they feel as now in in this time. He portrays free culture. So it just shows how the Me Too movement is so very serious that back then it was just considered like pure comedy. But if you will put something, if like a similar scene that happened like many years ago, if you put that in the movie now, it would offend like a lot of viewers. 
so they had to actually like cut his scene and actually take him out of the movie. Yo, your boy was a stalker though. Let's be real now. Yeah, man. Yeah. It, was <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious back then. I'm just when they watching us again, they just found like, wait, this boy so dumb. It's an actual cat and he's chasing after this cat. <laughs> he's a stalker, boy. Yeah. yeah, so you want to exercise quality care and you want no forms of harassment and no forms of uh, toxic environment. You do not want to be that toxic person at work that carries all the news and um, just, you know, makes people feel intimidated or like they're not a, a part of the group. Um, people are becoming suicidal um, because of things like this. So please, no no form of harassment, no matter what it is. And and, and exercise quality care where we give that same white glove service that we give to our clients, we give to the person sitting next to us. Okay? Just be dealing with real people with real issues. Okay? Um, Dania, I don't think we got your topic. What was your topic? No? Okay, fine. So, um, very good, very interesting topics. Um, I, you know, I like this um, more than me just talking for three hours. Now I felt that this was, you know, engaging and and um, everybody, most for the most part, did what they were supposed to do. I almost don't want to give you a quiz and just give you a grade for today. How, do, how does do that, that sound? Right, that's also we awesome. We can do that. Right let's, let's, let's do this. Oh, yeah, let's, 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 let's do this. Like do this. Right. Let's do this and forget time. about the sending the test in half an hour. Hey. Right. You all agree. But then when you all don't understand, five and six, then what? Okay. okay. So okay. That, that's one. Because well, well, I mean, well, we just do the same, the same, the same method of five and six. You just split, split the um, split the the chunking and the sections. So we, at least, at least now we know how to do it. I can we get additional research where we get like sources from other than the book and bring them forward to the discussion, to discuss in class instead of just extracting from the book and presenting it. Okay. That's fine. That sounds good. So we have um, chapter six, and really, because I did, I didn't want to give you all message overload. So my plan for chapter six was to um, give you, you know, just go over the control process, and that it just for the most part you would only be um, tested on the types of controls. So I don't know if the rest of that was going to be beneficial, and then I was going to allow you to, um, you know, spend some time on your mentoring project that will be do, you know, you have one week left. So, um, okay, what I'll do in, instead of the, the quiz, um, what I had planned, like I said, I was gonna give you the, on, on page 131, there's a crossword for chapter five. Everybody see that on 131? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so on 131, um, you complete the crossword and we'll forget. I, I'll just give everybody who participated today a grade and, and we'll forget about the quiz and we'll just go over the control process um, next week. And then we will focus on our mentoring projects. We'll spend the rest of the time doing that. And then the week after on chapters two and seven, I will assign um, the various topics and we'll do the same thing that we did tonight. Is that good? That's fine. That's okay. fine, man. That's okay, That's fine. great. Oh, uh, when is the cutoff time for the mentoring program? Again? Well, you're supposed to send it to me. Let me look at the date. The 19th. So the agenda says Tuesday, March the 30th. And so you have to email it to me on Sunday, March 28th. Yeah. So it should be in my email on Sunday, March 28th. Okay. Um, which which um, format do you want us to present it to you? And an essay, um, like- no, essay, essay form. Essay okay. form, okay. Yeah. But right. of course, you're going to turn on your cameras now, so we are all prepared. 
we're going to turn on our cameras on, on March 30th and we are going to, um, you know, present to the class. And again, we don't want you just to write an essay. We want you, yeah, would hope that over the last six weeks you would have been mentoring. You know, it's easy to tell when you just pick something and write it down as an essay or copy and paste it from somewhere. So I truly hope that you, you know, took the opportunity to actually go to mentor somebody and share your, your knowledge with them. So like you said, an essay will be just like, you know, your the whole process of what happened. The whole process as well. Okay, yes. Okay. So how you establish trust, how you communicated, um, what was the process, what was the topics that you discussed, and what was the outcome, what is the feedback? Okay. When is the puzzle due? Or are we doing this in class? When, when are we doing? No, you just do it for practice because you would have, I was giving that to you anyway, so you could answer those questions um, okay. on chapter five and chapter 10. And so again, those questions will be on the final exam. So the final exam, so please ask for your days off. Um, let's look at the agenda again. So everybody is in allowing me to share one second. There yeah, we share, share. Um, the final exam, when is it? On the 13th of April. And so right now, if I mean, normally, uh, you know, other people are they want to put in vacations. And so my computer having a session. Yeah. Okay. So on April 13th, the final exam. So if your employer does offer um, a study day, you know, I would take that day and the day before, or the, you know, whenever is available. And, and so you could start to prepare. And so it'll be chapter scan, five, six, two, and seven. Uh, just for to confirm, chapters 10, five, six, two, and seven will be on the final exam. Yes. Copy that. 10, five, six, two, seven, okay. Yeah. But for the most part, we covered the first chapters in, um, you know, and just so you're not so overwhelmed with, okay. with, you know, with the entire, like trying to scale back a lot of stuff so, you know, you actually retain some of it. Cool. Okay, so any uh, any other questions or concerns? Um, uh, so we just completed a course for it's in chapter five and then Chapter yeah, five. just on chapter five, because last week I gave you practice questions, right? Right, right, right. right. Yes. right. Yes, yeah, I gave you practice questions. And so next week, we'll just go over the control process. Shouldn't be more than one hour, if even that long. And then you will spend some time finishing, you know, or wrapping up, or just spend some time with your mentee, um, um, you know, so you could meet the 28 deadline. Okay. Okay, so we good? And did we find this, not just Ms. Bullet after the happening, did we find this more engaging or more would be more receptive to you know everybody just doing a portion? Would, was anybody overwhelmed by the portion that they had to do? Uh, not, not on this end. I found that it, it was it was exciting. It was exciting. It was interactive. So okay, okay, good, good. So we'll do like I said, because we're just gonna come. To chapter six, I'll get through the control process. And again, you can still read the control process so you can make a, a contribution. So we have some of you making a contribution, and then we only expect to be for an hour or less. And then we go on to spending some time with our mentee or you know, putting together our essay so we have sufficient time to make sure that we submit it on time and get full points. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, ma good. And then again, or take some time to get your five percent. Okay. Okay. So no further questions. We'll do this again next week. Okay. Night, all.
Good okay, night. Good 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 night all. Good night.